Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're so glad you could join us today for Civic Saturday. Uh, I am so grateful uh, that so many people have joined us today. And um, uh, as we uh, await some more folks uh, entering from the waiting room, um, I just want to begin by introducing myself. I'm Eric Liu. Uh, I am uh, the co-founder, along with my wife, Janae Kane, of Citizen University. And uh, we want to welcome you to Civic Saturday. Uh, this is uh, for those of you um, for whom this is your first Civic Saturday, and actually I know uh, that's many of you. Um, I wanna just give a little bit of a word uh, of context for what, uh, what this is all about. Um, Civic Saturday is one of our core programs at Citizen University, and uh, we uh, conceive of it as a civic analog to a faith gathering. Uh, and the idea is that what we're trying to do is reinstill a sense of uh, belief uh, and faith in democracy and the possibility that our system can actually be responsive uh, to us as Americans. Uh, and at Civic Saturdays, generally, we uh, take that civic analog to faith gathering rather seriously in the structure. We um, often will have, uh, we will begin with song uh, and poetry. Uh, we will turn to the people seated next to us uh, back when we were able to be seated together uh, in a large space. Um, there would be a reading of a text that you might think of as civic scripture followed by a civic sermon. Uh, and then we would break up into what we call civic circles, uh, an opportunity for um, everybody who's joined the gathering to really uh, spend time with each other to make sense uh, of what we've shared uh, together. Well, today um, our format is going to be for many reasons uh, different. And that's not just because we're virtual. We've been doing uh, virtual Civic Saturdays for some time now since the pandemic began. Uh, but we're doing things differently uh, for the more obvious reason of what's been going on uh, in our country since the murder of George Floyd, uh, but I think more deeply since the murder of George Floyd revealed to us uh, the depths of the hypocrisy and the depths of the gap between our stated creed as Americans and the actual deeds uh, that we the people uh, have let go on for too long. And so today's Civic Saturday is gonna have a different feel uh, and a different structure. And um, I wanna just give you a little bit of sense of what we're going to be doing. Um, as we gather, we're not going to have song today. Uh, we will in a moment have uh, a bit of silent reflection. Uh, instead of having a poem read, we're gonna share a poem for you to silently read on the screen together so that we can feel each other doing that in silence. Those of you who are from the Seattle area know that yesterday there was an incredible moving powerful march, a silent march, uh, led by Black Lives Matter here in Seattle and King County. And to see tens of thousands of people marching in silence was a reminder of the power, uh, not only of voice, but the power, in fact, of intentionally withholding voice so that people can be heard in a different way. And that's why today there's no sermon from me, as we often have at Civic Saturday. Instead, we have a very special guest here, my friend and colleague and collaborator, uh, Reverend Dr. Willis Johnson who I'll introduce uh, in greater depth uh, in a little while. And we will have some conversation. And after that, we're leaving a great bulk of time today uh, for Civic Circles. And again, for those of you who've been to Civic Saturdays before, you know that Civic Circles are often fairly unstructured with a single question or a thought to prompt a uh, conversation wherever it may go. And today, we want to be responsive to the times and actually provide a bit more scaffolding uh, for the Civic Circles. And to scaffold you from that reflection and discernment to action and commitment, uh, and to maybe give you some ideas about how together, both in conversation and in mutual commitment, uh, we can get there. Uh, so that's the arc of the time we're going to spend together today. And again, I, I just want to express my deepest gratitude to you for joining us uh, today, um, uh, and uh, to our whole team at Citizen University for pulling this together, and of course, uh, to Willis Johnson, who I'll introduce momentarily. But let me actually begin right now by inviting us all just to hold some silence with each other. And um, if you are moved to want to close your eyes, that's fine. If you're moved to want to just, uh, you know, in the weirdness of uh, the screen, just to look at me, I will look right back at you. But let's just hold silence for a bit.
we're now going to share uh, on screen a poem by my colleague Elizabeth Alexander, a remarkable poet. Um, she was the poet at Barack Obama's inauguration in 2008. And I invite us together now to read this poem silently. Thank you. We will be sharing that poem and all the other materials, uh, both in chat and uh, later uh, as we record this gathering here. Um, I am so, so gratified now uh, to bring into Civic Saturday uh, my friend Willis Johnson. Uh, Willis uh, and I have known each other for a few years. And uh, uh, when we first met, uh, he was the pastor at Wellspring Church in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, right across the way from the police station in Ferguson. And uh, Willis uh, uh, was very much in the middle uh, of the uprising and uh, the demand for change that arose in Ferguson and spread around the country in 2014 after the killing of Michael Brown uh, by Darren Wilson. And in the moments, hours, days, weeks, months uh, after that killing, uh, Willis uh, did something which actually became later the title of one of his books called Hold Up Your Corner. He held up his corner, not only by uh, trying to bring all of that justifiable rage and anger that emerged in Ferguson uh, into the conduits of change in civic life, both in St. Louis and Missouri and all across the United States, but also in, in a way that would extend beyond that moment created something called the Center for Social Empowerment that still exists there in Ferguson. Um, and in more recent years, uh, Willis has uh, gone on to uh, plant the seeds of a new church uh, in Columbus, Ohio, where he, uh, in the suburbs of which he resides now. Um, and uh, as a leader, a civic leader, a faith leader, uh, a teacher uh, at uh, Methodist, uh, Methodist Theological School um, in Ohio, uh, Willis has been uh, a voice of, well, actually, in a way that I'll explain in a moment, a voice of agitation in the best possible sense, starting from within, within our own hearts, uh, to without, uh, in the ways that uh, we can agitate uh, a system that needs agitation. Uh, so, uh, Willis, welcome. It's so good to be with you today. I believe you remain muted, uh, Willis, so we're going <laughs> to... Oh, that's, that's only my family's dream. Um, <laughs> no, friend, it is truly an honor to be with you and to be with such a beautiful mosaic of, of humanity on this, uh, on, this, uh, on this call, this gathering today. Willis, um, I, th there's so many things I want to ask you, and um, the first thing I want to just begin with is uh, thinking about six years ago, um, and the ways in which you made it a matter of heart and mind and spirit to uh, try to uh, convert that protest into durable power. Um, and I remember reading somewhere along the way, um, a couple years after um, those initial protests, uh, that you'd hoped that you'd planted some seeds that maybe others down the road would harvest, that you knew that, that even though things had begun to change in Ferguson and uh, with a new prosecutor and new members of uh, the elected council there, uh, that change had not come fast enough and that you'd hope simply that seeds had been planted. And uh, as you look 
back at that time and from that memory, look at where we are in the country today. Um, what is your assessment of what has indeed taken root and, uh, uh, and what still needs to, uh, to be planted? Yeah, um, well, I, I believe that there is, uh, there are um, uh, things are blossoming and uh, obviously pollination is real uh, because uh, uh, not all those seeds landed on, 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 on great ground or good ground in Ferguson, but much did and is showing itself uh, springing forth. Some of those folks that I pointed to that you've referenced uh, six years ago, uh, making their way into council, into leadership. Uh, one has just recently ascended to the seat of mayor as the, not only the first African-American, but the first female to lead uh, that small little hamlet in the Midwest. Um, uh, many of the voices and faces and personalities, as well as a, a lot of the movement, or what has become known as movement, uh, those, uh, those seeds have uh, also begun to blossom, flourish, and take root and shape and further uh, create um, in many places, near and far. And so I think uh, it would be wrong for me not to point to some of the, the positives um, and, and some of the gains, and yet there is still much for us to do. There's still much work to be tended to. We were talking recently, Willis, about um, the ways in which you, um, you know, to use education talk inductively, without necessarily plan, but just by listening to what was around you, mm -hmm. started figuring out how to teach a lot of the uh, people, particularly young people, um, who began to show up at the Center for Social Empowerment about what it looked like to start building uh, that pipeline for, uh, for, for change. Um, and uh, you, you really, you, I actually wrote it down here in my notebook. You know, you, you, you said there were no big T teachers. Uh, we, we were all teaching each other um, about what it meant to, um, what it meant to grow uh, okay. together. Um, and when you Think back to that time and look at the ways in which, as you say, pollination is real, right? Uh, not only the fact that the hashtag Black Lives Matter is being uttered by uh, people and institutions that you could scarcely have imagined would be uttering it uh, or branding it uh, uh, five, six years ago or even five, six months ago, uh, but beyond that, the fact that uh, this nationwide resurgence of commitment to racial justice is happening in a way that extends well beyond the people who initially catalyzed things after Michael Brown was killed, who initially showed up after Philando Castile was murdered, who initially showed up um, in the wake of Sandra Bland and, and so forth. When you think about the reality of that pollination, there is an excitement, but then there is also something that you've described, this kind of a, a gap of knowledge uh, about how to close that gap between that initial commitment to show up uh, and then the long-term change that's got to happen in dismantling white supremacy in every system, not only the system of policing and criminal justice, but the education system, the economic system, the system of philanthropy and nonprofits. Yeah. Um, how have you, in these last six years, what have you learned about what it takes actually to fill that gap in the pipeline from the initial surge of passion and commitment to um, the, the systemic change that has to happen. What, what, what have you learned from people that you've been watching and nominally teaching about how we do that? Yeah, um, well, I, I, I wanna be honest, you know, we're continually learning. <clears throat> we're, we're, we're continually trying to grow in that. I think um, what we've taken away is that one, you've gotta create the space, the environment you, you, for, for even the experiment or the exercise or the opportunity to, to take hold. Um, you not only have to do that, but then uh, what is it that and how is it that we are um, um, learning and becoming new? We have always tried in our, in our work, whether through the center and our teaching and in consultation with communities and, and such across the country, um, and even in my ministry, to try to figure out how do we help people grow <laughs> how do we how do we grow? What are the growing edges and the learning? And so we've experimented as as much as possible with all the ways that we can we can learn, we can share, we can become more um, or deeply um, more informed. And then and then uh, the greatest thing is to create uh, or in, in, in encourage and inspire and hold accountable one another, take account and hold accountable one another to do something to try 
I mean, some of this stuff we've been we've been espousing and, and reaching for with no real attempt at at trying. Um, uh, and so that has been the greatest learning of at least having not maybe all the answers, but uh, offering up a framework or a, a model for at least beginning to mine and to to uh, uh, work towards becoming the changes we wish to see. This idea of becoming new, as you just put it, uh, Willis, is, is so powerful to me. And I think, um, you know, you've said many times, even though you are quite literate in systems of power and making change at a collective scale, uh, you, you've often said that becoming new become, begins with a commitment yourself to become new, right? Yeah. Um, in the heart and in the spirit. And, uh, and you've described, uh, you know, uh, doing that wherever you may be. You are not in Ferguson anymore, right? It's six years later. You are um, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, you live in a suburb. Uh, uh, and uh, you've described how that changes your sense of what your responsibility is. And uh, tell folks a little bit about just how you've, I mean, e even from something as mundane as how you've been going running. Um, how you've been showing up from where you stand and sit now um, in a way both to make yourself new, but to give people an example of how to make themselves new in this time. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if I said this to you previously, uh, Eric, but uh, I guess other people are listening. I'm just talking to you like it's just me and you. But uh, I kind of feel, feel like I has been. Um, I'm a former, I played sports in college and stuff. And so a uh, co couple weeks ago, we were downtown. Um, and a pro the protest made its way um, not too far from where um, my wife and I were. She was handling some important business. And uh, I saw him coming and I, I rush out where we were at to the corner and I'm an onlooker. And I, I kind of had that moment where I was like, I'm gonna get in this line, I'm gonna walk with him. You know, we gonna shut this down. And, and, and then it passed and I just did like everybody else. And I took a picture. And uh, I kind of feel like the quarterback who throws a pass and remembers when and says, you know what, but I also remember getting hit. And uh, I'm good being, being on the sidelines. Um, it is different. And, and it's different for a number of reasons because of my social location, as you pointed to, is different, not because I can't, but because what is required of me or what would be most responsive of me in this moment um, has evolved. It's not any less. It's not even. It's not any greater. It's just. It's just different. And so I have taken to this idea that um, that our responses um, to to be um, in reflection or even um, to be engaged um, should be evaluated and met appropriately. I've taken to um, this idea that we should be invited into ways to resist or to to respond with our everyday ordinary lives. Um, so many of us want to do the hard thing, the heavy thing, the distant thing. Um, and if we start with raising the questions and acknowledging where we are and where we're not, um, finding affirmation or seeing ourselves in the process of being um, instrumental or engaging um, in the ways that we not just are comfortable, it's not about being comfortable, Matter of fact, even in the running, I get up every day, I'm a runner. That's one of the things I do. And I let that time be, has, I've let that time be a time of, of processing and, and of, for me and my spiritual practices of prayer. Uh, but it also, in light of what the recent events, uh, it is a part of me that I refuse to allow anyone to discourage me or, or, or take from me what is the strength, what is the, re what is the right, what is the necessity for me in my life? And so I've turned that into an exercise of not only prayer and processing, but I've turned it into my own act of, 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 of kind of protest. And so uh, when I was at Ferguson, I used to run from my house to the memorial, to the memorial of Michael Brown. Now I run um, uh, uh, to remember, but I also run to be an agitator. Um, I purposely run against traffic out here uh, in uh, Franklin County of, of uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I make cars have to see me. And uh, I give myself points for cars that, you know, first of all, thankfully, uh, avoid me. But I like to see them kind of like the squirrels in the, uh, in the, in the insurance commercial uh, that make the car kind of swipe and move around them. I know it sounds a little devious, but um, what it marks for me is 
and what I hope to teach from it is that maybe in this time we all are called to figure out what is our mode and what is our medium and what is our means towards um, truly living into both the purposes um, and the prospects that we so desperately want to see come alive, like racial dignity or human dignity, um, overcoming racial inequity and overcoming racial justice. Part of it is us taking the responsibility or making possible and clear to people where we're at, um, what's not right, inviting them or forcing them if need be to see us and to see what ought to be or who we are in this moment or in this place and and find the ways that are ways that you can truly commit and remain faithful to to live into and live out for me my faith which is also an act of resistance you well as this it is a measure both of uh where we are and how little we've moved that, that we live in a time right now. I mean, uh, we're just running. The simple freedom of running um, is not only an act of resistance, but it is an undertaking that you acknowledge carries some risk. And I don't mean the risk of running against traffic. And uh, I, I mean the risk that need not be stated of what's, uh, what's, what's been going on in our country and, and why people you know, you are measuring and marking your running um, from the number of days that it took uh, between the time that uh, Maude Aubrey was hunted down and killed and charges were filed. Um, and uh, but that particular form of agitation, if you may put it that way, just calls to mind a, a text that we've talked about. And, um, and this is a, maybe a, a nod to what we often do at Civic Saturday, and that is to have a piece of civic scripture a text from the American tradition that can orient us. And I just want to share that on screen. Um, it's, it's a text taken from an 1857 speech that Frederick Douglass was giving at a commemoration of uh, what was then called West Indian liberation. Um, and, uh, and I think the, I'll just let folks read it again silently. What's best known from that passage of the speech is the last sentence, the last two sentences. Uh, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Uh, yeah. But I think in some ways, uh, at least as pertinent today, um, is the second sentence. Uh, uh, those who, uh, and it's gone from the screen now, but uh, um, those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground, right? And so th this is a question we will uh, turn to shortly uh, in civic circles about the meaning of agitation. Uh, but I I'm curious for you, Willis, right now, I mean, uh, you are building a new uh, congregation, not only rooted in place there in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, but frankly, because of the pandemic, you've both had to and gotten to uh, create a ministry online uh, that is reaching well beyond those geographic borders. Um, uh, and I know that your practice as a faith leader is one part of your uh, commitment to that kind of constructive agitation. Um, uh, but I also know from work that we've gotten to do together that um, another form of that is you've been invited to um, help the ecosystem of organizations that work on civic engagement all over the United States. Uh, the civics industry, if you may shorthand it that way. Yeah. Um, you know, in the same way that a few years ago, there was kind of hashtag Oscars so white. I mean, you could do it the same way. Hashtag civics so white, right? Mm -hmm. let, let, let's be real. Uh, the industry, the field, the people who go into it, whether it's teachers, practitioners, board members, you name it. Um, and you've gotten involved in a lot of ways now um, to help figure out how that industry, if I may put it that way, that ecosystem um, can not only be more diverse and inclusive, but can indeed um, put at the center um, a greater commitment to racial inclusion, racial justice. Um, what's been working? What's been frustrating to you uh, about that undertaking of trying to change these broader systems um, of people who profess to care about civic engagement um, and yet uh, maybe haven't, haven't gotten in the habit, don't want to, want to but don't know how to uh, deal with questions of race and racial injustice? Yeah, well, I, I, I will 
I will say that it's it's not just in that sphere. It it crosses over um, even into the other spaces where I where I engage, particularly uh, faith communities and, and and the alike. This this last in this most recent time, once again, the nation's conscience has been pricked and has um, been awakened. But what continues to put challenge me and, 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 and hold me um, uh, to the fire in this work is that I'm still not sure if we were wanting um, to let our hearts be changed. If we're really desires to be in my language of my tradition, repentive. In other words, there's a whole lot of folk who are deeply concerned and wanting for things to change. And yet the types of change uh, that um, are required, uh, we're not as desirable to, to participate fully in. So um, I, when people ask me about, well, what is needed? Well, we need to find greater ways to recruit and diversify and bring more voices and, and bodies and experiences, uh, not only to the table, but into the, the menu and into the, into the, uh, the offering of what is um, going to be the leadership, the facilitation, the programmatic designs that, that you know, da, 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 da. Uh, when I talk to people about particularly not only resources, not only resources and intellectual um, capital, uh, developing intellectual capital, uh, but what does it mean to actually fund something uh, uh, e uh, equal to in or in, a, in, the, in excess of uh, what you do for typical or majority organizations. The first thing they want to say is, well, they're not scaled to this. Well, you know, last time I checked, um, uh, most things that are big now didn't start out that way. I mean, uh, Apple was a few people who, you know, used to hang out and couldn't find no friends at school and hook, hooked up in a dorm room and, and you know, uh, campaigns. Black, Black, Black Lives Matter was three women on Facebook. Yeah, well, and, and it wasn't even meant to be a movement. That was them just coming up with, 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 with a, uh, I don't say a slogan, but with a, a moniker, or with a signaling that says, would speak and invoke unity that people moved into. And so um, what I hear from folks and what I feel challenged to in this season is two, twofold. For, for folks who are not oppressed or often othered, my question to you is how are you willing to truly leverage your privilege and let go of what is your per perceived and, 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 and assumed or presumptive positioning around um, sharing your privilege or sharing the resources. Um, you got to think about that. I, I mean, that's what I hear when I, especially in democratic circles, there's a whole lot of money going around. And to be honest about it, we give uh, minority and marginalized groups peanuts on the dollar. There's a whole lot of folk getting a bunch of money who are not people of color doing work in the name of depolariza depolarization, um, empowering communities of such who mean well and are good spirited, who are doing just kinds of things. And yet uh, the same folks who look like me, you know, don't get that empower don't don't get that same sense of empowerment or endowment. The second part to it is this. At some point, we have to, um, I think, help to um, build on the continuum of not only protests, but take the energy, take the take the resource, take the genius, take the take all that what is happening now, and begin to also provide um, resources of 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 every of every design and and need, and allow for the people. <laughs> to be able to not only govern and, 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 and delegate and delineate um, what is appropriate for moving that work, but also doing it across and up and down the ladder of work. So now that we have um, this great massive work, um, gatherings, how are we taking that energy and that same constituency and moving them into the, to the places and into the, to the activities that help them realize or actualize the outcomes they want to see and not continue to have to hand them off to leaders, a certain group of leaders or a particular generation um, for them to usually drop the ball. Well, Willis, um, you have actually brought us uh, uh, rather seamlessly um, into what we want to spend 
uh, most of the balance of this hour uh, doing, and that is to um, invite everybody who's participating, uh, 150 or so folks who've gathered here today, uh, to form into civic circles. And before we actually uh, do that, I wanted to say a word. As I said at the beginning, um, today's civic circles are picking up right where uh, you just left off, Willis, on the idea of how do we convert that energy into forms of concrete commitment, uh, both as a matter of moral commitment about recognizing and learning one's own privilege and position uh, or lack thereof, um, and then also how to convert this passion uh, into sustained literacy and power um, so that we can begin to change systems large and small. Um, and uh, I want to bring into the conversation um, our, uh, at Citizen University, our senior manager for learning experiences, Talia Gilman, um, who has helped to design uh, the shape of today's civic circles um, so that she can give folks a sense of the uh, intention and the scaffolding uh, behind it before we um, uh, send you into uh, groups of uh, uh, four or so for this kind of reckoning and conversation. And then Willis, you and I will come back. Uh, and I urge you, um, if you are folks who are participating, um, you know, if you took seriously anything that Willis Johnson just said, um, this is when actually the gathering begins. We were just the warm up. Uh, and so don't even think about, uh, oh, okay, I saw the show part, the conversation part, I'm going to check out now and, you know, make lunch or whatever. Uh, this is where the work begins. Uh, and uh, Talia, um, why don't you give us some sense of the shape of what we're inviting people into? Well, thank you, Willis and Eric, for creating this space for us to think and feel and act our way forward to, to really prepare and propel ourselves into the work of transforming the earnest sentiments that are bringing each of us here today uh, into concrete change within ourselves in the ways that, that you've been talking about, Willis, and, and within our country. So what we're going to do now is, is break into these civic circles. And for the next 20 minutes or so, you'll be with three other people to engage in some structured dialogue to really clarify and, and fuel our commitments to real action. And at Citizen University, we teach that true patriotism means my country when right to be kept right and when wrong to be set right. And as we all know, what's brought us here today and, and what Eric and Willis have been speaking to is that things are, are not right. So how will we set them right? And we are gonna invite you to base your circle conversations around three questions that riff on a model that, that Willis teaches and writes about. Acknowledge, affirm, and act. Acknowledge. In order to change anything, we have to actually deeply understand it. How is our social contract broken? What's that gap that Eric referenced earlier between American creed and deed? And what's contributed to this gap, this brokenness? Affirm. In order to change anything, we have to be committed and understand why. Why is it our duty as an American, as Americans, to help set things right. Act. This is the most important. This is why we're here and we're gonna move into intimate conversation together. How will we channel our understanding and our commitment? How will we agitate to lift up Fre Frederick Douglass's words to convert the possibility of this moment into concrete progress, into the racial justice we so deeply need? And we wanna offer some ideas for how you might agitate, what we're calling action moves. And maybe you're already deep in this work, or maybe these moves can help spark your commitment making. First, learn. Read, watch, listen, reflect about racism and white supremacy in America, and about anti-racism. How can that become a part of each of us? Learn to widen your lens. Build civic power literacy. Consider who has power and how to remake that power map locally and nationally. Pushing for policy change. What systems need to be changed to actually create equity? Changing community norms and practices. How are we going to make our American culture one that's committed to racial justice? What does that look like from the minutia to the large scale? And how are we going to circulate power and resources from money to leadership and to, and to um, leadership of the structures that, that make up our society? We're going to share these action moves and the questions I just went over in the chat so you can keep referring to those as a group. 
And we'll also email some more in-depth information about these in a follow-up uh, communication after we say goodbye today. But for now, prepare to be virtually transported to your breakout circle. And as you do so, remember a few final notes. When you get into your Zoom room, just take a moment to introduce yourself by name and where you're calling from. We're here to, to share ideas, but also to remember and make space for each other as, as human beings. So take a look at the discussion questions together and dive in. And as you do so, make sure that each person has the opportunity to talk before you speak again. A big part of our task is to cultivate self-awareness about how we take and share space. And most importantly, just make the most of this time that we have together to make sense and make commitments. And I think our colleague Tanum is gonna help us make our way into these rooms together. And as we do, Talia, thank you so much for that really wonderful uh, encapsulation of um, what we're gonna do here. I just wanna note that we will come back then um, at the end, Willis and I, um, for some closing thoughts and, uh, uh, and mutual commitments. So, um, uh, we send you forth now into your civic circles. I wanted to invite you back both with gratitude and appreciation, uh, as well as with a sense of invitation um, to join us again, um, to share with us what you're learning and experiencing. Um, uh, I uh, had the honor of being in a uh, breakout uh, in a civic circle uh, with uh, a fellow named uh, uh, Lennox Aitan, uh, 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 who is himself a uh, faith leader, a Methodist faith leader, as it happens, uh, uh, outside of Chicago, uh, an immigrant from the West Indies, from St. Vincent. Um, and we had such a powerful conversation, um, partly about what it means to agitate, um, agitate hearts, agitate comfort co levels, uh, agitate complacency, um, but also that there are ways of agitation that do not require um, what typically gets understood in the mainstream media as agitation, which is the visual scenes of violent confrontation. That agitation begins with the asking of a question. Agitation begins with the holding up of a mirror. Um, and agitation begins with what Willis was saying about knowing our own hearts and being able and willing to open them, uh, but it does not end there. Uh, we teach at Citizen University three laws of power that are all beautifully and painfully in evidence today in the United States. Uh, the first law is that power compounds, it concentrates. Those who have will tend to have more. Those who have not will tend to get ground down and have less. We see that that is the story of America in so many ways. The second law of power is that power justifies itself, that those who have will spin elaborate narratives about why that is and why that ought to be that way. And when you combine those two narratives, what you have, those two laws of power, the power compounds and it justifies itself, you have, in short, the story of white supremacy. You have the story of male supremacy. You have the story of structural racism built into the foundations of this country and yet not named as such. But what breaks us out of the doom loop of those two first laws is the third law, which we teach and we teach in earnest. And there are times in our country's life where people kind of dismiss this law because it sounds a little too woo-woo. But right now it's one that if you are awake and aware, you are seeing it alive, blooming, pollinating everywhere. And the third law is this, power is infinite. And even the most rigged, broken, unjust systems, it's entirely possible to generate brand new power out of thin air through the magic act of organizing. That's what happened starting in Minneapolis and spreading contagiously across the country and across the planet. It's what's happening right here, right now with us. The way that we are gathering together, and this may not be organizing in the sense that we're asking you to sign up for this election or sign up for this petition. But make no mistake, this is organizing. We are learning how to join a club. We are learning how to listen to others. We are learning how to hear the stories of someone like Lennox, who spoke about the way in which he serves a congregation in a more conservative part of his state. And as an immigrant, understood in the codes of our country as a black man, how he has to work both gingerly and persistently with a sense, as he put it, that his faith demands that he call his comfortable congregation into discomfort. That's organizing. 
That's the magic act of organizing. And the conversations that we've begun in civic circles today are part of what we not only invite you, but urge you to carry forth in other ways. As Talia said earlier, we will send out an email shortly in which we provide a, a little more detail and color along or about each of those next moves of action that we've suggested. But more broadly, we wanna invite you into, into the continuing work of Citizen University so that we can learn together, move together, agitate together, and help ensure that the promise of this country is one that we can actually, for the first time in the life of this country, deliver upon. Our faith demands it. Our faith in our creed, our faith in this thing called the Constitution, our faith in this Republicans experiment. It's been so powerful to be with you in this way. And I want to leave the last few minutes here uh, for Willis uh, Johnson. Um, who, again, I'm so grateful for having joined us, having sparked so much rich reflection and conversation, having been a leader, a servant leader, modeling your own humility and recognizing that you are where you are and you're not where you're not, you stand where you stand, but that wherever you sit or stand, you can lead from there and you can catalyze from there. So Willis, um, thank you again, and um, please share for as short or as long as you like your closing thoughts. Oh, well, thank you. You, you humble me, friend, and I'm grateful that uh, um, uh, all of us have come uh, by the means of technology and we look like uh, much more the world than others would have us to think. I pray that you are um, inspired on today, um, that you know you're not by yourself. Uh, though we may be physical distant, that doesn't mean we need to be uh, spiritually or socially any more disconnected uh, than uh, life makes it. And so on today, I want you to do as we've been encouraged. Uh, where there is not space, where, wherever space you're in, where there's not something that's right, and in my language and expression, what's righteous, I want you to identify that. I hope you will take on the charge and uh, the challenge to know that uh, it won't be better or can't be changed unless someone, and uh, who better than you, uh, take up uh, some form of responsibility and uh, respond. And then lastly, whatever it is, however it is, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you don't have a choice not to do something. And so I hope you will find um, in your heart and uh, as far as uh, away from your hand <laughs> or your feet, or even uh, in, the, in, in the genius in the kumba or the creativity that you possess, a way to act, express, live into um, the promise. Because each and every one of you has been gifted and graced, given something bespoke or unique to you, that if you don't share it and deposit it in the world, we will be left bankrupt because of it. So don't cheat us and don't cheat yourself. Go win the day. Thank you, Willis. Thank you all so much for being part of this gathering. Um, and we hope you will carry that spirit of commitment and learn together and keep teaching each other about what it means concretely to show up uh, as a catalyst and an agitator for racial justice, for the mattering of black life, and for the deliverance upon the promise of equal justice under law in the United States and beyond. Thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll join us again in a future Civic Saturday or otherwise. Go forth and do good.